With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, Go to reallifepharmacology.com. Get your free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Uh, Great study guide, great refresher, uh, great study tool. Uh, If you're taking pharmacology classes, board exams, uh, absolutely a no-brainer to go get that. Simply an email uh, will get you access to that. All right, with that, let's get into the drug of the day today, and that medication is methimazole. If you remember a few weeks ago, I did propothiouracil, and these two medications are from the same class of antithyroid medication. So why would we want to block thyroid hormone? Well, that's probably pretty obvious if you've got a patient with hyperthyroidism. Mechanistically, how does this drug work? So ultimately, I think it's really important to remember T3 uh, being one of the major thyroid hormones, the most active thyroid hormone. And ultimately, methimazole is going to block the production of T3. How it does that, it basically prevents iodine. It prevents oxidation of iodine um, by doing that. That's a key uh, player or a key role in the production formation of T3. And so by blocking that process, ultimately you're going to block T3 formation. Now this is important to remember in the fact of a patient maybe with acute hyperthyroidism who's very symptomatic, maybe they're a hospitalized patient, for example, in that methimazole, doesn't touch circulating T3, T4. So again, that T3 in the bloodstream that's going to have the physiological action of thyroid hormone, uh, that's not going to be prevented or stopped by methimazole if it's already been produced. What it's going to to do, what the drug's going to do is prevent further production or at least reduce further production of T3 and ultimately bring down those levels. So it's it's not an immediate fix um, in an emergency type situation, which is why we often um, pair methimazole uh, or PTU uh, with a beta blocker, for example. And I wanted to touch a little bit more on that because I don't think I did it much in the propothiouracil uh, podcast. So if we've got an acute life-threatening situation um, with thyroid storm, typically propothiouracil is probably going to be the one that's selected unless there's a contraindication or compelling reason not to do that. And it's a little bit better, at least acutely, at blocking T3 formation. Now, if you remember back from that propothiouracil or that PTU podcast, uh, I talked about methimazole probably is what you're going to see most often in practice when it comes to a chronic long-term use, okay? And and that certainly uh, is true, of course. So getting into dosing a little bit, um, one of the reasons why that methimazole is used uh, kind of preferentially long-term is administration. So we, we don't have to administer this drug as often as PTU, which in a chronic type situation, yeah, we we don't want patients to have to take medications frequently um, because we know the more and more we require of patients, generally the less and less they're uh, going to do or have the ability to to remember to do. So because of that, methimazole is is favored uh, more on on a chronic basis. And that initial dosing of methimazole may vary depending upon the severity of hyperthyroidism. So clinically, you're going to look at the patient, and that starting dose could range from anywhere to um, 
5 to 20 milligrams, maybe even up to 30 or 40 if it's a really uh, severe type situation. We also may look at uh, T4 uh, to help guide dosing. So in patients with kind of a more modestly increased T4, maybe one to one and a half times the upper limit of normal, that's a patient where maybe we start, you know, only five to 10 milligrams, Uh, 1.5 to two times upper limit of normal. Maybe we get a little bit more aggressive, 10 to 20. And then of course, you know, two times and above really, you know, more severe cases, uh, you may see that 20 to 30, possibly even up to 40 uh, milligram initial dosing there. So methimazole is typically dosed just once a day, and because of its kinetics, it's got a longer duration of action. So with those kinetics, we can get by with once daily dosing. However, in practice, you may see it split uh, from time to time, and this is primarily due to uh, adverse drug reactions and and tolerability. And so getting into those adverse effects, uh, GI upset can happen with this medication, and that's going to be a dose-dependent effect. So in patients where I see the dose of methimazole split, uh, that primary reason that we're doing that uh, is likely to minimize GI upset. Other adverse effects to pay attention to, uh, symptoms of hypothyroidism. Uh, So just a, a quick review here of what symptoms of hypothyroidism or low thyroid Uh, thyroidism looks like uh, fatigue, uh, weight gain, cold sensitivity, maybe some weakness, uh, effects on skin and nails, so dry skin, brittle fingernails, brittle fingernails, excuse me. Um, Those are primary symptoms of hypothyroidism. Other adverse effects potentially, uh, probably not as common, uh, rash, myalgia, uh, taste disturbances, so this is kind of a unique one. Um, with this medication. And then rare adverse drug reactions, uh, myelosuppression risk, and LFTs uh, being increased. That's liver function tests being increased have been reported as well. Now, I will note, I mentioned uh, the convenience of dosing it once a day. That's an advantage for chronic use over propothiourosome. PTU has a boxed warning uh, regarding hepatotoxicity. And methimazole does not have that. So that's definitely another advantage of methimazole as well. Monitoring parameters, probably going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, Thyroid hormones, so T4, T3, TSH. Uh, Hepatotoxicity, CBC, potentially is clinically indicated, um, but probably not something we're going to uh, routinely do if there's no clinical Uh, indication to do that. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that duration of action as far as a a pharmacokinetic principle goes. Uh, Duration of action with methimazole is 36 to 72 hours. So again, goes back to demonstrating why um, once daily dosing is a possibility there. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. Go check out meded101.com slash store. I've got a great list of resources for pharmacists who are preparing for board certification. BCPS, NAPLEX, Ambulatory Care, BCMTMS, Geriatric Exam. Uh, all those resources are at meded101.com slash store. In addition, if you're a nurse, uh, we've got the MedEd 101 Guide to Nursing Pharmacology. Basically a great Uh, listing of really common stuff that you're going to see in practice as well as uh, on your nursing board exam. So again, you can find that on Amazon, uh, Meded 101 Guide to Nursing Pharmacology. If you're another healthcare professional, we've got a ton of links at meded101.com slash store. Guides on drug interactions, uh, polypharmacy, so that's a great resource uh, for folks who are in the geriatric space as well. And again, uh, your support there at meded101.com slash store helps support this podcast. All right, wrapping up with drug interactions. Not too many to worry about with methimazole, which is a good thing. Uh, Digoxin concentrations uh, can go up, certainly. Uh, Warfarin action can be reduced. 
uh, so it can kind of counteract uh, the effects of, of warfarin. Obviously, in the case of digoxin and warfarin, we can check drug levels there and ensure that we're uh, remaining stable uh, and basically within the goal therapeutic range that we're looking for. Digoxin, I'm seeing less and less use uh, in the setting of heart failure. We're getting more and more medications with SGLT2s and things like that, so maybe not quite as relevant. And then warfarin has fallen out of favor some uh, compared to some of the newer uh, anticoagulants like apixaban, rivaroxaban, uh, that podcasts on um, all of these medications I've, I've mentioned in the past. So uh, go search reallifepharmacology.com and, and you can get a lot more details on those drugs as well. And then lastly, as far as uh, drug interactions go, uh, I will briefly mention, you know, myelosuppression risk. So if you have a patient who's already taking you know, higher doses of chronic corticosteroids, uh, there is potentially a risk that we could have an additive effect there. Again, pretty rare uh, with methimazole uh, causing that, but I think it is important just to note that. And then, of course, uh, that hepatotoxicity risk definitely is not as great with methimazole, but if you think about other drugs that can cause hepatotoxicity or um, patient situations, so such as alcoholism, for example, or alcohol use disorder. Uh, valproic acid comes to mind, uh, excessive acetaminophen intake. So these are all situations where we can kind of maybe add on to that effect of uh, hepatotoxicity. All right. Well, I think that wraps up the podcast for today. If you enjoyed this episode, found it helpful, please leave a rating, review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me uh, mededucation101 at gmail.com. And of course, please support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Any purchases there go directly to help support this podcast and help keeping it free and available for all those healthcare students uh, who are looking to uh, hone their medication-related skills. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, avoid prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.